ask that you would meet me in the gospel according to St. Mark, chapter number 12. And I will be reading several verses of scripture, but I want to preach one. I'll be reading several verses, but I want to preach directly from one. The Gospel according to St. Mark chapter number 12, and I will be reading verses 28 through 30. When you have it, signify by standing on your feet, which is the custom of the house. The Gospel according to St. Mark chapter number 12, verses 28 through 30. If you have your Bibles lifted in the air, whether it's paper or electronic, it's still the Word of God. It's lifted in the air and say, repeat after me, this is my Bible. I can have what it says I can have. I can do what it says I can do. I can be who it says I can be. Today I'm going to be taught from the word of God. I boldly confess that my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living seed of the word of God. Now tell the devil just in case he's lurking around, I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name. Mark chapter, thir- chapter 12, verses 28 through 30, and I will be reading uh, from the English Standard Version, which reads like this. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, meaning Jesus, the scribe asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. I want to focus in on that 30th verse. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. If you allow me to title this time we have together, I would like to preach from the subject, Withholding Nothing. Withholding nothing. You may be seated. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, we have come to the time in this worship experience where the proclamation of your word and go, God, we acknowledge that we cannot do it without you. That even in our best strength, even at 100%, we not only are incapable of carrying the power of your word, but God, we are, we still fail in proclaiming it. But God, you have made provision in our weakness that you extend your grace and your power. And so we ask now, God, that you would empower this, your humble servant. 
that you would hide me behind the cross so that they not see Preston, but they see the Christ that lives within me. Speak to your people now. Because God, in these days and times, we need a word from you. Speak, God. Let your word pierce our very souls. Speak, God. Let your word engage our minds. Speak, God. Let your word convict our hearts. Speak, Lord. Let your word transform our lives. Speak, God for your servant hears. In the mighty matchless name of Jesus the Christ, we pray, amen and amen. Withholding nothing. In his book, All In, Mark Batterson tells a story of A.W. Milne, and A.W. Milne was one of a group of missionaries known as the one-way missionaries. Now, you might ask, well, why would they be called that? Why would they be referred to as one-way missionaries? I'm glad you asked. In case you haven't read the book, let me uh, just give you a little bit of it. They were uh, referred to as such because these missionaries would purchase a one-way ticket to the mission field and instead of packing their bags and packing their suitcases and and packing luggage uh, they would pack just a few earthly possessions and only the necessities that they needed to go on this mission trip and instead of packing them in samsonite and other luggage louis baton and all of that they would pack these few things that they needed for this trip in coffins. These missionaries knew and they understood uh, that they would never return home from their locations, but they went anyway. A W Milne set off, uh, Milne set sail for the South Pacific. That was the mission field that he was called to. And he set sail knowing full well uh, that the headhunters that lived there had martyred each and every missionary before him. Yet he went anyway. Milne didn't fear for his life because he had already died to himself. For 35 years, the book goes on to tell us uh, he lived amongst the tribe uh, that he was sent to. And not only did he live amongst them, but he loved them. For 35 years, he served them. For 35 years, he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when he died, the tribe members buried him right in the middle of their village. And they inscribed this epitaph on his tombstone and his tombstone read like this. When he came, there was no light. But when he left, there was no darkness. What an example of a man that did not withhold anything from God in his service to God. How many of us can say that we have surrendered all that we have, all of ourselves to God? And if God called us on a mission that seemed like a suicide mission, uh, that we too, like Milne, would comply. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to clap. Just look forward. The focus scripture of uh, this pericope is found in Mark chapter 12, verse 30. And it echoes the Old Testament text that is also found in the 6th chapter of Deuteronomy and the 11th chapter of Deuteronomy and, and the 15th chapter of Numbers. This passage in the Jewish religious circle is known as the Shema. Somebody say Shema. And it is labeled as the Shema because the first word in this passage in uh, uh, the Jewish faith is hear. The Jewish word Shema means to hear or to listen. Hear, O Israel, 
The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. The Shema became the Jewish confession of faith and was recited by pious Jews morning and evening so that they never forget the command of God on their lives. This recitation begins every synagogue service and they recite it over and over um, in every service. I believe that this command, that this mandate is not just for our Jewish brothers and sisters, but I believe that God is crying out in this day and time to the people of God and he is crying out in the Shema and he's saying, listen my people Believe that he is calling for Christians to love him without withholding everything. I believe that he is calling for us to love him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. I believe that God is calling for the people of God to not only make God a priority in our lives, but I believe that God is speaking to us today and saying, people of God, I want you to make me the priority in your lives and then allow me to order the rest God is calling for some folks who will withhold nothing from him he's calling for some people who who when he's looking for some folks that some people that are sold out and are all in and he's calling for some people that he can use to impact the world after they have died to themselves and are living for Christ and so if God is calling for us to be these people, if he's calling for us to surrender all to him, because we like to sing that song, I surrender God all to Jesus. I surrender all to him I freely give. But after we finish singing to him, how are we living? I ain't going to get no help on this one, but I'm going to preach it anyway. And so if God is calling for us to do this, how do we get there? Uh, we know that it's not going to be an easy road. We know it's not going to be an easy task for any of us. But how do we get to a place where we are withholding nothing from God? Let me draw your attention to the scripture text in Mark 12. And we question Jesus is is here and, and the religious leaders are surrounding him and they're throwing questions at him. And Jesus is questioned in the text, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus responds with this text. He said, loving God with everything that we are and loving others as ourselves is the summation of and the fulfillment of every other command of God. If you love God with everything that you are and we love others as we love ourselves, every other commandment will be fulfilled because we have purpose in our minds to do those two. We'll treat each other right if we love God with everything that we are and we love others like we love ourselves. We will serve God the way we should if we love God with everything that we have and we love others as ourselves. These two commandments put every other commandment in order and perspective in our lives. Uh, let me let me break this down to you. The Shema commands that we love God with all of our heart. Somebody say heart. The Greek word for heart is cardia, and it's the root word for cardiology. And 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 <clears throat> and it says it goes on to say we are to love God with our mind. Somebody say mind. 
In this context, the heart isn't referring to the muscle in our chest that pumps blood throughout our bodies, but it means our thoughts, our feelings, and our mind. In the text, the mind refers to the deep thoughts, the imagination, and our understanding. And so we are to love God with our thoughts, with our feelings, with our mind, and then it goes even deeper. We are to love God with the deep thoughts, with our imaginations, our emotions are to love God and we are to yield these aspects of our lives to him in order to honor him in our lives. Now I'm going to challenge you for a little bit. You ain't got to say nothing. You ain't got to expose yourself because I know everybody is in church and we all acting holy and stuff. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But I need you to take a second to think about some of the things that you think about when ain't nobody else around. You don't have to say nothing. Look straight ahead. Uh, Do your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions honor God? Look straight ahead. Don't say nothing. Don't look. Just look straight ahead. I would imagine for most people, including myself, the answer to that question might be no more often than not. Yet God is saying that he wants us to surrender our thought life to him, not just those aspects of our thought lives that we deem acceptable, not just the times where we are just so conscious of God and hallelujah and Lord, I I just focus on you and I'm meditating on you, but God wants us to surrender those ugly thoughts, those inappropriate thoughts, those things that we think about when nobody else is around, those uh, those unacceptable thoughts that if the church folks knew uh, these things were running around in your mind they wouldn't want to sit next to you on the pew that you're at right now those things that we meditate on but can't share with nobody those things that we ponder about but we can't tell anybody those things uh, uh, that that trouble our spirits that that wear out our souls but we can't share them with our prayer partners those things that we struggle with in the midnight hour and we cry out to God about because we don't think that we can tell anybody else um, God wants those things he wants those thoughts he wants those deep seated wounds that grieve our soul and vex our spirit he wants those things that we wrestle with in the midnight hour that drain our confidence and derail our destiny God is saying today I want that stuff I am the God and want to be the God over that Jesus wants us to yield our thoughts and our feelings Because he says, I already bore all of those burdens on the cross. Why are you continuing to carry those things that I've already nailed to the cross? Why are you continuing to struggle with those things that I died for? Why are you still allowing your past and your mistakes to weigh you down? I am crying out to you, saith the Lord, in this day and time. Cast all your cares on me because I care for you. Stop allowing your thought life to hinder you from surrendering to me and fulfilling the purpose for which I've created you. I think I need some help in here. And so how do we bridge the gap between where we are now in our thoughts and feelings and the call of God in the Shema to love him, to love God with our heart, 
with our mind, with our feelings, with our emotions, with the deep things, our imaginations, our wounds, our hurts. How do we bridge the gap between what we are experiencing now in our reality and what the God of the universe that created us is calling for us to do? I'm glad you asked today. God gives us clear instructions on how to achieve this in two portions of scripture I want to lift up and share with you. The first being found in Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Write that down if you're taking notes. And this verse says, to let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. We've heard that so many times before. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Uh, uh, but what does that mean how can I have, how can you have, how can we have the mind of Christ? The text calls us to have the same mindset that Jesus Christ had uh, when he walked the earth. Well, what mindset is that preacher? Uh, Jesus was determined to fulfill the will of God in his life. Watch this. Even when it was difficult and uncomfortable. Y'all didn't get it, so I'm going to say it again. Uh, uh, what is Jesus' mindset? Jesus Christ had determined to fulfill the will of God in his life, even when it was difficult and uncomfortable. Okay, uh, uh, let me give you some more information because y'all don't believe it yet. So uh, let me show you. Jesus came to the earth for one purpose and one purpose only. That's to die for our sins. That's what he came for. 100% God, 100% man. But this wasn't a task that Jesus just easily just, you know, strolled through. Oh, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be beaten. Everything is fine. He was 100% man. And so in his humanity, he struggled with the assignment. Uh, 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 let me prove it to you. Um, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Before Jesus was about to be betrayed, he, um, before he was about to be betrayed, uh, he prayed. He went off by himself from his disciples and he prayed. And the Bible says that he was in such a degree of anguish that the sweat poured out uh, like drops of blood. And he cried out to his father. He said, Father, if there's any way that this can be done without me going through this hellacious situation, let this cup pass from me. He was in such anguish and, 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 and uh, uh, scientists have, have uh, postulated um, about the sweat and the sweat coming down as drops of blood. And they've said that it could have been a medical issue where he was in such mental pain. He was in such anguish that blood vessels in his head began to burst. And when they burst, blood was coming out of his sweat glands. He was in such anguish understanding because he was 100% human and 100% God. In his godness, he knew what he had to do. But in his humanness, he wrestled with the pain that he was about to endure. Oh, God, help me in here. But yet, after the end of this prayer... After his humanness had cried out in anguish, his godness took over and he understood what his assignment was and he purposed in his mind that I'm going to fulfill the call of God on my life and I'm going to fulfill the assignment because my children's lives are hanging in the balance and so he said, nevertheless, not my will. But thy will be done. Preacher, how do we get this mindset? How do we 
uh, surrender everything to God even when it's difficult and uncomfortable because uh, some of us don't even want to come to church when the weather's bad much less go through this type of experience some of us don't even want to serve God unless it's comfortable some of us don't want to come to church if the air conditioning don't work some of us uh, don't want to uh, offer our uh, gifts and talents unless it's convenient how do we get to the place where we have the same mindset as Jesus Christ where we are determined regardless of what the calling requires that we're going to fulfill the call of God on our lives well, let me point you to familiar passages of scripture found in Romans 12 and 2 hopefully this will give you uh, some insight on how to get there in the uh, contemporary English version that verse informs us to don't be like people in the world but let God change the way you think you might know it like this. Let this mind be in you. I mean, uh, 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 be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's the same thing, same principle. We can't think like worldly people think Amen. and expect to complete the, the purpose of God in our lives. But we have to allow God to change the way we think from a worldly mindset to a spiritual mindset. Then the text goes on to say, then you will know how to do everything that is good and pleasing to him. Let me back up a second. Uh, only when we uh, allow God to change our mindset will we know the the will of God for our lives and not only will we know the will of God for our lives we will have the mindset of Christ to do the will of God for our lives regardless of whether it's easy or not we can't withhold our thoughts and feelings from God but rather we can bring them under captivity to God how do you know preacher that we can do that some of the things that I think about are a little deep and so how do I bring my thoughts into captivity I can't reach out and grab them I can't handle my thoughts how do I deal with and bring in alignment what goes on in this head I'm not going to give you Philosophy. I'm not going to give you psychology. I'm not going to give you anything. The only thing I have to offer you is the word of God. And the word of God says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't fight a fight in the flesh. We don't fight against folk. We don't fight against things in the natural. But our weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You're talking about spiritual warfare. Amen. I think I said last week some of us are trying to fight a spiritual war by natural means. And when you do that I gave you the analogy it's like trying to win a baseball game and you were on the soccer field with a soccer ball. No way in the world you're going to win a baseball game with a soccer ball. That don't even make good sense. Well, same thing in the spirit. You are not going to win a spiritual battle, my brothers and sisters, fighting in carnal ways. You can slap all the people that you want. You can go in folks' mouth. You can cuss them out. You will still lose. Because the war that we are waging to against are not uh, against your boss, it's not against Sister Susie, it's not against Brother Jimbo, it's against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's why I ain't going to spend my time, waste my time uh, uh, fighting against President Trump because that's not where the war is. Uh, we can do everything. We can impeach him. We can do all kinds of stuff. When he leaves that office, the war is still on. 
because the war didn't start with him and it ain't going to end with him until the church begins to rise up and fight this war in the realm that it is meant to be fought with on our knees of marching and, and pulling down strongholds. That have ingrained themselves in this country and in our government. Let me go on because some of y'all get nervous. Uh, it says casting down imaginations. And everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We have the, the power and the ability to pull down imagination, spiritual wickedness, and anything that puts itself above the knowledge of God. We have the power to bring it down. Not just that, but to bring into captivity every thought. I didn't say it, it's right there in the text. We have the ability to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so whatever you think about, that you don't want nobody to think, know you thinking about it, you might be thinking about it right now. Look straight ahead. Don't say it, just look straight ahead. You have the power, we have the power to bring that thought under captivity to Christ. The only way to know and accomplish the will of God for our lives is to surrender our thoughts, our mindset and feelings to him and allow him to change and conform our thought life to his way of thinking so we will know what the will of God is for us and we will have the mindset of Christ to complete the will of God in our lives. We are to love God. The scripture goes on to say with our heart, with our mind, and then the text goes on to say we are to love God with our soul. Somebody say soul. The Greek word here in the text for soul is suke, and it means spirit or breath. How can I teach for a little bit? Uh, this is the essence of who we are. We are not natural beings covering spirit. We are spirit beings covered by flesh. We're not natural beings. Let me say that again. We're not natural beings that just happen to contain a spirit. We're spiritual beings that are covered in this flesh. And so when this flesh dies, our spirit lives on. And so we are to give God the essence of who we are and that spirit. This flesh is going to die. But the spirit will live on. And so the text is saying that the essence of who we are needs to be surrendered to God and it is to love God. Psalmist offers a literary analogy of how this demand should be expressed in our lives. I know I'm giving y'all a whole lot of scripture, but just write it down. You can go back to it when you get home. The psalmist says in Psalm 42 and 1, it says, As the deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. Thirst is one of the most powerful needs and the desires that we have. Being made of approximately 70% of water in this body, the human body can, can go without food for 30 plus days. But the body can only survive without water for about a week. Therefore, the deer craves after water um, and is driven to satisfy its thirst because its life is literally dependent on the fulfillment of that thirst. Watch this. Likewise, uh, that is how we should be 
with our overwhelming need of God. That's how our soul needs to thirst after God. Uh, we need to thirst after him from our soul just like the deer pants for the water. Uh, we should be um, so overwhelmed with the need of God in our soul that as that deer pants for its thirst to be quenched, our soul needs to desire and pant and seek and thirst after God because our very lives depend on it. We are to love God with our very essence and our essence should cry out more and more for him. We are to love God with our heart and our mind. We are to love God with our soul. And lastly, we are to love God with our strength. The Greek word for strength is iskus, and it means power or might. The Hebrew word com uh, comparable to uh, this word means that we are to love God vehemently with our energy, with our power, with our effort, with our strength, we are to love God. Some of us love other folks more than we love God. And it's those folks that hurt you when you still give them everything that you, you still love them passionately. You still, oh God, if I can't have you, I don't know what I'm going to do. It always astonishes me when I meet folks and they've broken up and they oh, I don't know what I'm going to do, Pat. I just can't live without them. And I try to stay in pastor mode. I do. I, but I look at them and I have to admit, y'all pray for me. But I do have a sarcastic nature. I know it's, I know y'all, y'all can't imagine your pastor being sarcastic. I understand that. But, but my sarcastic spirit rises up and I want to ask them, well, what did you do before you met this booger? Amen. Were you dead? And they resurrected you? And you fell in love with them? Inquiring minds want to know. But I don't say that. I, I, I encourage them in the Lord. And I tell them it's going to be all right. God is going to bring you through it. You're going to find love again. And maybe if you surrender yourself to God and surrender your mind and your heart and your spirit, God will send you the person that has his heart that's going to love you like he loves you. All right, that's, that's all the singles ministry that I'm going to throw out right there. We are to love God vehemently with all of our strength and our power that we have. We are to love God. With all of our energy, we are to love God. Uh, well, uh, you might be sitting there now, and like I said, to look straight ahead so the folks sitting next to you don't know it's you, but you might be sitting there, you might be thinking now, well, Pastor, that seems to be a lot that God is asking of me. I don't know if I am going to be able to live up to those commands that God, God is really asking a whole lot of us. And my response to you would be, it doesn't even compare to the love that God has shown us. Because when I think about the fact that God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, he sacrificed his, his life, he, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. When, when I think about the fact that Jesus loved us so much, 
that while we were yet sinners, before you got yourself in church, before you stopped doing some of the things that you were doing when you were big enough and bad enough to do them with whoever you did your stuff with, how many times a week you did your stuff and then twice on the weekends. Christ died for us. When I think about the fact that in dying for us, an innocent man allowed his creation to beat him all night long. His back was laid bare as they whipped him with a, a, a whip that had bone and metal tied into it. And so every time they beat him and they pulled the whip back, that bone and that metal dug in his flesh and pulled it out in hunks and in chunks pulled and ripped his body to shreds so that he was not even recognizable when they put him on the cross when I think about the fact that even after that, after they beat him all night long, then they weren't finished. They took him up uh, to a hill called Golgotha and then they nailed his hands on a cross and they nailed his feet on the cross and they lifted him up and they put the cross down in a hole and, and he hung there bleeding and bloody and in pain when I think about the fact that he hung there for us doesn't compare to what he's asking for us to do and then they were not done with him when I think about after they have beat him after they had nailed his hands and nailed his feet they took a spear and pierced him in the side and the spear pierced not only his side but it pierced his lungs and blood and water came out and so after his lungs collapsed because they were pierced in order for him to draw a breath he had to pull himself up on the nails that were in his hands and he had to pull himself up uh, from the nails that was in his feet every time he was to take a breath gasping for air because the blood and the water began to fill his lungs and he was drowning in his own fluids doesn't compare to what he's asking for us and when I think about the fact that he stayed there and dying and he would not give up the spirit until everything that the word of God had said about him was fulfilled he hung there not for what he did but for what you and I did it can't compare can't compare to what he's asking for us when I think about the fact that he took on the sins of the world when I think about how his blood paid the price that was too high for us to pay when I think about uh, how he cried out to the father father why hast thou forsaken me when I think about the price he paid I can't help but cry out, what shall I render unto God for all of his benefits? What shall I render unto God for all that he's done for me? What shall I render? What is it that I have? that could even come close to what he has given me. What can I possibly offer in this pitiful life that I have? What can I possibly give him for the gift of grace that he's given me? What can I possibly offer to him for the unconditional love that he has given me, what can I possibly give to him? For the peace that passes understanding that keeps my heart and my mind through Christ Jesus, what 
can I possibly bring to him for the joy that he gives me that's unspeakable and full of glory? What can I possibly give to him that can match all that he's given me? Giving him my heart is not enough. Giving him my mind is not enough. Giving him my soul is not enough. Giving him all of my strength is not enough. There's nothing that we can give Jesus that can even come close to the sacrifice that he has made for us. And so I declare, I'm done. I declare, like the songwriter, William McDowell declares, he says, I give myself away. I don't know if there's anybody in here today that understands the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the price he paid for your life. But when we truly understand Christ's sacrifice, when we understand the sacrifice of God giving his son, when we understand the sacrifice of his son giving his life, the only acceptable response is I give myself away. Lord, so that you can use me. Lord, take my life. It's in your hands. I, I, I long to see your desires revealed in me. I give myself away so you can use me. Take my heart, take my life as a living sacrifice all my dreams my plans lord i place them in your hands i give myself away lord so that you can use me